We've been talking about how to manage your first high stakes project. We started by alleviating some of your anxieties, and then we talked about how to manage the situations where people want to change course or bring up new ideas. In today's final episode on this topic, we're going to talk about how to keep your team motivated to help you ship your product. So stay tuned. Welcome to Build, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar. In each episode, innovators and I debunk a number of myths and misconceptions when it comes to building products, companies, and your career in tech. So finishing that last 20% of any project can be challenging. People get burnt out and demotivated. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how you can keep them motivated and get them to successfully ship. And to help us out, Jen Leach is back. You'll remember Jen is a VP of Engineering at Trust, a software consultancy. Thanks for joining us, Jen. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So you've done a lot of projects throughout your career, and you know, as well as anybody out there, that that last 20% is the hardest. People get demotivated. They burn out. So let's talk about why this happens to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so really, the fundamental reason that this happens is that the last 20% is never actually 20%. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a 20% that you imagined when you thought about the project. Okay. But in terms of the amount of work involved, it's usually the most tedious and painstaking tasks that are reserved towards the end. Um, when you get towards it, to the end of the project, that's when you, new stakeholders start showing up and having ideas about things that need to happen on the project that weren't already there. So the the final 20% ends up being like another 80%. Uh, so uh, it, it, four times as big as yeah. you thought it was going to be. So that's that can be demotivating for people. Um, and, uh, and people who thought, if they really thought that they were towards the last 20%, then it's especially demotivating because they they suddenly see the work explode in front of their, mm-hmm. you know, in front of their eyes when they they hadn't really thought that it was going to be that much more. So there's a number of things that are causing the project to get bigger towards the end. One of them you mentioned, scope creep. How do we handle the situation? Yeah, so um, this is the point in the project at which you need to get really aggressive about defining exactly what you're trying to deliver and why mm-hmm. and for whom. Mm-hmm. And digging into every request that it comes in okay. and understanding how that impacts the final project. Mm-hmm. Um, it, so the, the process of digging into that in, involves really having a, a good sense of who the users are, who the stakeholders are, and talking with those people as much as you possibly can. Uh, if a person comes in and wants to see a particular feature, you need to really understand why they want that feature, mm-hmm. um, whether it's something that they dreamed of as part of their project from the beginning. That's something that they they thought would be um, really wonderful for users, or whether it was something that they determined through recent user testing mm-hmm. is going to actually dramatically impact the target market for this product. Um, understanding where those those ideas come from, the business impact of those ideas, how well vetted the idea is in terms of hard data. And then from there, you can parameterize whether, okay, this has been vetted, it's really clear how this impacts our business interests, it's the straight path towards our our goal, we need to get this particular thing in, do we need to cut any other features? Are the other features irrelevant now? Yeah. You know, how does that change the whole scope of the project? So that's one, one angle. Another angle is this idea is something that sounds really great. I love the idea. We haven't tested it. Yeah. What's the quickest path to create a test to try to validate this hypothesis? Can we create a little feature? Mm -hmm. Can we create a mini version of this thing? Do we need to do have a fully fledged version of this thing? How do we gather information to inform our direction so that we can make sure that we're going in the right on the right course? I really like what you said about being aggressive with pushing back, especially when it's going to expand the scope and it's not something 
that has a clear business goal uh, versus like the thing that has a very clear direction. The challenge though for many of us is if that is an important stakeholder coming in, then we worry about what will happen if we push back. So how do you navigate that conversation? Yeah, so I feel as though uh, many of the tactics that we described mm -hmm. in the last episode yeah. apply here. Yeah. Uh, so when someone comes in and they have a particular idea, how they want to see something go, they're not going to be happy if they feel like you're shooting them down right. without having thoroughly considered the idea. Mm -hmm. And if you begin to really investigate that idea with them by, um, you know, asking questions to reveal assumptions about the idea, following the idea through to its ultimate conclusion, that can clarify both for you and also the other stakeholder at the same time mm -hmm. the aspects of that idea that are uh, things that you should run with that yeah. are going to improve the product and that are maybe relatively low cost. And maybe there are aspects of that that you can leave on the table for now and you can tease those things apart. Yeah. And if you go through that process collaboratively with the person who brings the idea in, then they, are, at the end of the conversation, they're going to both feel like they've been heard, that you have really fully considered their idea, and very likely they will be glad at the things that you pulled out and left on the table. And sure. you have facilitated the process mm -hmm. of helping them see what the most valuable nuggets of that idea are. And that's a huge value to be, bring to a project. But here's the deal. I am so exhausted. It's been three weeks on this project. Mm -hmm. I don't even have the energy to facilitate that conversation because I'm borderline burnt out. And this mm -hmm. is maybe the second or third request that the stakeholder has done. Yes. What do I do? Well, to be honest, <laughs> you should probably walk out of the room. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, Politely, maybe. Politely, mm -hmm. politely walk out of the room. Uh, when you are truly are burnt out mm -hmm. and you've truly exhausted your emotional reserves, that's when it's time for somebody else to step in mm -hmm. and take that role. Yeah. Uh, and you should expect that that may happen at some point in time. Okay, good. And prepare for it. Yeah. Um, and so the preparing for it process mm -hmm. is all about sharing your load with other people on the team, mm -hmm. teaching other people on the team to do what you do. Yeah. Uh, so um, on this particular project that I was have been referring to from mm -hmm. last year, one of the things that I did on that team is I asked individuals from the team to rotate through the team facilitator role. So I would ask um, everyone from the team, mm -hmm. whoever they were, to run sprint plannings, to run retrospectives. We would have uh, design discussions where we would have um, design exploration right. and then design critique. We would pair discussions where mm -hmm. we, uh, they weren't exactly brainstorming, not, not like, like the, you know, everyone put sticky notes up kind of right. brainstorming things, not like that, but the exploration and, and exploding of an idea mm -hmm. to gather as much as you can. Um, then have somebody go and, and write those ideas up, and then we would get back together to make a decision. Mm -hmm. the, the pro, all those processes have some kind of facilitation involved with them. Right. And we would have every member of the team facilitate those processes. Um, then when it came time such that somebody was out sick, right. somebody um, needed to take a break, it was on vacation, those processes could continue to occur mm -hmm. without interruption. And they vary a little bit, and that's fine. Yeah. And each person who has taken that role then is also much more invested in the team mm -hmm. and a much better contributor to the process. Uh, so, so essentially, you need to reduce your best factor. I'm sorry. Yeah. Improve your best factor yeah. by increasing the number of people who have that skill set. Now, the challenge with doing this, though, is there's a lot of handoffs, mm. which means a lot of setup and teardown, right? Like yeah. If I'm handing something over to you, I might say, here are the things that we talked about before. I mean, like you said, it's great for uh, the bus factor, but it mm -hmm. is not so great when it comes to that added mm -hmm. investment of, okay, now I need to talk to Jen, and then Jen needs to talk to so-and-so, and each time they're doing that, that's an additional time cost. So you're referring to handing off responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
so one thing that I discovered is that um, so part of the handoff process mm -hmm. involves creating um, a set of really simple, well-defined processes okay. that are easy for anyone to follow. Okay. And each time a new person stepped into the role, they would refer to those processes and say, hmm, I don't fully understand X. Yeah. And then we would augment the process to cover a case that somebody didn't understand and needed an explanation for. Mm -hmm. Um, and we used these process documents to hand off the role, so eventually it didn't really require a conversation either. Okay. But what about people who might game the system? Like, say somebody is a stakeholder, right? They know, okay, pretty much is kind of a pushover, so when she's the facilitator next time, I'm going to make sure I get my ideas in, because Jen, she's really good and aggressive. I'm never going to get my ideas passed through her. How do you handle those kind of well yeah. you know what, what ends up happening is yeah. that although one person is designated to make sure the processes are happening mm -hmm. everyone in the room eventually becomes a facilitator okay and the facilitator uh, role is really just about setting the stage mm -hmm. and if everyone in the room has rotated through that role mm -hmm. everyone in the room is trying to make it happen okay and it, it's you you no longer have a single point of failure okay Let's say that facilitator doesn't show up that day or yeah. they're not feeling very well. Someone else just does it mm -hmm. because everyone's done it. Okay. No so you, do you feel like there's a level of accountability then where people wouldn't necessarily be able to come in and game the system? Yeah, because the, the more the more people who – every time someone steps up and begins running the system, mm -hmm. that really clarifies why there's value Okay. with – with facilitating collaboration, facilitating a collaboration in a way that that inclu includes everyone's opinion, for example. Okay. Um, the more people facilitate it, the more they understand the value in it, and then the more they reinforce it whenever they're in a discussion. So then there's that dreaded deadline, and sometimes it gets moved up or it gets pushed back. In the event that it gets moved up, we're kind of scrambling. In the event that it gets pushed back, we start procrastinating. So how do mm -hmm. we kind of hold ourselves to that that deadline? I actually think that the case where it gets moved up is the easier case. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so when, when a deadline gets moved up, um, you know, assuming that you, you're working with humans, <laughs> you, have, you have resource constraints. Yes. So uh, the first thing that I look at is the project scope. Mm -hmm. And if you have defined what your, uh, your deliverables are, the things that you absolutely must have in the product, mm -hmm then you can look at those and think, well, are there ways that I could deliver that in a way that is um, slightly simpler mm -hmm. or in a way that maybe doesn't handle quite the data throughput that we thought we we're going to need to handle? Because maybe in the first week, maybe we don't really need to handle that data throughput. Mm -hmm. uh, so having the deadline moved up can actually reduce you to be more aggressive in paring down what you're delivering in a way that can actually be really helpful. Uh, and if the uh, paring down process is something that you bring to stakeholders and they say, oh, but we really need all these features, uh, then you, you, have, you, you have hard data that you can point to and say, oh, especially well, if you're using a project tracking mm -hmm. system, something sure. which, like Pivotal Tracker, like Pivotal Tracker yeah. Um, which, is what, which is what we use, yes. then you get estimates for the amount of work that the team can do in a sustainable basis and projections for um, how much you'll be able to complete by a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. Yeah. And those are real data-based estimates. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I didn't intend to pitch Pivotal yeah. here, but I, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, I actually, I love their company and they do some great things. So... Um, uh, then you can, you can bring that to the table mm -hmm. and then have a really a really clear, just honest discussion about here's what the team could do, right. here's some features we can deliver, what do you think? How do we solve this problem? Again, yeah. trying to solve it together. Yeah. Um, when, the day, when the deadline gets moved out, mm -hmm. that's when it gets more, more difficult. Right. People start procrastinating. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you already have people who uh, are thinking about the last 20% <laughs> as 20% when it's actually 80%. Yep. And then all of a sudden when you move the deadline out, then it's so easy to um, 
check relax out. Relax a little yeah. bit, you know, to to think, oh, well, that pro- that feature isn't so big and not realizing that you're misestimating right. the amount of work that's involved. Um, so uh, one of the things that I try to do, especially, you know, so this works for both when deadlines are moved out and also when a deadline is being set for you that's actually really far in the future. Oh, okay. Yeah. So as an example, um, you know, we had a deadline last year that was nine months in the future. Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, so we, um, what I did is I created an internal milestones document. Nice. So I, you know, created a bunch of internal deadlines for the team that we we should be aiming to hit. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't hitting those things, then we should be reconsidering what we're doing. That helped a lot um, to to focus the team and to keep us on track. And then when you build out intermediate milestones, then you can set an internal deadline for completion, sometimes even months ahead of when you think it's going to be. And create that that pared down, really, really lean version of the product that is going to maybe validate the hypotheses that you have about what you're building and why you're trying to build it, mm-hmm. and add extra you know business value mm-hmm. to the project for the company by saying, okay, so you asked us to build this, you want it by December. How do you know that that's right, the right thing to build? Yeah. You know? So you, you get to you get to then have a version of it that uh, that lets people play with it enough so that if you're building the wrong thing, you, you can yeah, yeah you can change it before the real deadline. Right. And even though the business has told you they want X by, by date Z, if you give them a smaller version earlier and discover they were wrong, right, they will be singing your presence praises to high heaven. Yeah. That's. That's what they really want. What they really want is the answer that's going to serve their customers. Yep. And if you, if that's what you're keeping in mind, then you're going to be having a really successful product at the end of the day. Awesome. So you've done these kind of shorter shipping dates with the milestones, right? So you're kind of doing it iteratively. You're shipping periodically. What do you do, though, right after maybe that first or second time that you've shipped? Because mm. I think a lot of people forget. They're like, ship time to go on vacation. It's like... Hold up here, right? Because you've broken it into milestones. There's another one coming up. There's another sprint, release, whatever you like to call it. Right, right. Uh, well, it depends on what you've shipped. I mean, you know, if you've if you've, if you really shipped your true milestone, you should probably go and have a party. Yeah. Like celebrating sure. your results is actually has real value to it. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, um, you're all, you're getting ready to collect data. Okay. About what you've built, mm-hmm. and. This is this is a part of the process that I think is sometimes, although we talk in our industry a lot about like gathering user research and being product driven and making sure that we're building for, for the actual users. Um, however, I think that I, I've seen fairly often that people feel as though they've, they've built a great product, great, you know, let's move on. And they can sometimes forget who all the users are. They should, can sometimes forget what it means to be successful. And uh, as an example, um, and, and then maybe not, not gather that data. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a huge failure mode that, um, that I'm constantly trying to correct for. Mm-hmm. The one example is uh, I talked about a validation system that somebody might build uh, in one of their earlier episodes. Yeah. And uh, we came up with an idea for the validation system, which was based on real user experience from a previous system that the mm-hmm. company had built. We built this new design, we rolled it out, and it was basically working. Mm-hmm. It was basically, you know, it was allowing us to quickly and easily specify checks on data that we had generated. It was doing it in a way that didn't, didn't cause us to repeat ourselves too frequently in the code. It was doing it in such a way that people who were not engineers could author the validations and look at the results. Uh, we were able to say with a higher degree of certainty that the data was correct. Mm-hmm. However, at the end of the day, uh, because it was serving these fundamental use cases that we knew we had, that maybe the previous system had not solved these use cases well. So it was already better. Yeah. We knew that. But we could have dug in a bit more. 
And we could have dug in a bit more by by going back to um, the users and saying, okay, um, do you want to use this? Um, when you use it, what are the things that really irritate you? Mm -hmm. And dig into those and and get a good sense of why your baby's ugly. Mm -hmm. um, it sometimes is painful to do right. that. Yeah, because you just shipped and you just had that party. And nobody wants to have a downer after. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, it, it, and you want to celebrate. And uh, but then after that, um, kind of. Pull your boots back on, you know, get back, <laughs> get back out there and be yeah. like, okay, we were wrong. How right. are we wrong? And, and, and that's the thing is that um, every time I ship a product, my first question is, okay, let's assume we're wrong. Let's find out how. Yeah. <laughs> and, we gotta make it a game a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and if you, if you come from the assumption that you're always going to have it wrong, then that's how you get it right. Yeah. If you ever come from the assumption that you were right, it's guaranteed that you're going to miss how you're wrong. Sure. Yeah. Or, or maybe that situation, but there's a new situation. You can't apply that same assumption. So new yeah. situations change. Um, there's going to be data left on the table if you don't go get right. it. Right. No, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jen. I know I could talk to you about project management forever, but I think this is a great place to stop. And I know you've given our audience a lot of awesome strategies. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So any final words for our audience out there? Yes. So I uh, mentioned that uh, we run a consultancy trust and we do consulting. So we build all sorts of different kinds of software. We do infrastructure. We work with big data. We work with highly sensitive data uh, for the government, including health healthcare data, things that are um, highly regulated. We solve a lot of different kinds of problems, and we would absolutely love to help you solve yours. So if you have a hard problem to solve, please come hit us up. We can find us online at trust.works. And we have a form that you can fill out there to request a quote. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. That's it for this week's episode of Build. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive more great episodes like this one and short build tips. Ciao for now. This episode of Build is brought to you by our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker. Pivotal Tracker.